I'm going to discuss pre-incident safety, which is chapter four from your book. Like all previous chapters, you should have read the chapter first and then follow along as we're reviewing this PowerPoint. So the learning objectives. You should be able to describe safety considerations in the emergency response station, or the fire department station. Explain safety considerations as they apply to emergency response vehicles. List the components of an effective response safety plan and describe the components of a pre-incident planning process. You should be able to list the information that should be provided by the pre-incident plan. Describe the considerations for safety while training. Describe the components of a wellness fitness plan. And describe the considerations for interagency coordination as it applies to health and safety. So as an introduction, it would probably benefit the fire service more if we can identify the risk before incidents. And if we can prevent it from happening, then we can make sure that all of our firefighters go home in the morning after they get on duty and that we try to reduce the numbers of risk. We understand that it's a dangerous job, but we want to try to reduce those risks and make them easier to manage. And try to make them as, as controlled in an uncontrolled situation or environment. And while the environment's uncontrolled, we can control our actions. There's seven categories of pre-incident health and safety, and the life safety initiatives that we're going to discuss in this chapter are from 6, 11, 12, 13, and 16. So what we're going to start first is in station considerations. And most people, if you ask them why is the fire service a dangerous job, they probably would never even mention the fire station. But I've seen quite a few injuries over my career that have occurred in the fire stations because I think we tend to let our guard down. When we're designing our stations, and there's whole there's a whole NFPA standard nowadays, or standards, that apply to fire stations, and we should follow those standards. And we should make sure that we're following local building codes. And we have to. You just can't say, oh, we're gonna build a fire station and not follow codes. And where this comes in to effect is that if you have a two-story station like you see in this picture, then if we build a station nowadays like this two-story station here, it would have to have an elevator to accommodate disabled people. Now, people say, well, it's a fire station. You can't have disabled firefighters working. And while that might be true, that doesn't mean that you can't have support staff that are disabled, that you might have city employees that come to work on your station that might be disabled, and you cannot leave them out of this planning process. What's really big nowadays, too, is we want to build our stations as environmentally friendly as possible. And if you see fire stations that they're building nowadays, they, they're lead-proof buildings. And we'll make them as environmentally friendly as possible. Again, there's, these are ongoing operations. These fire stations are occupied 24 seven. What that means is that we're in these buildings 24 hours a day for seven days a week. These stations have to be working. Yes, it's a controlled environment, but we have to make sure that these stations can provide our employees with a good place and a safe place to work. And that's, that's really the highlight, is it has to be a safe place to work and also we have to make sure that these stations can stay upright in an earthquake or some type of disaster. What we have to do is we have to make sure that these buildings won't fall down if there's an earthquake because our apparatus are inside. We should have regular inspections for various hazards. Most departments I know of have typically station captain will be assigned to do an inspection of the station once a week. And in my department, this form was at four copies and no copies required, NCR and one copy was kept in the station, one went to the training and safety chief, one went to the support chief who was in charge of stations, and one report went to the city safety officer. And this was a safety inspection. Now, maybe you do it at the part of shift change, but this was typically, we did them on Sundays. And the objective was, was to prevent unsafe acts. And you'll see on your slide here, it says forbid unsafe acts, and we should do that. We should not make sure that we hurt somebody because they fall backwards in a chair and hit their head and may not be able to continue their career. We understand, we don't accept it, but we understand that the fire service is dangerous and we could get her doing that. But who would want their career ended because they fell over backwards and had a head injury? 
it's important that we don't forget the office to make sure that all of our chairs, all of our equipment is safe, that we don't have broken equipment there. And we should have department procedures on how to do the inspections, what should be done, and how often they should be done. No one should ever say, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. So when we talk about apparatus, they should meet all applicable standards. And what does that mean? And what that means is that it should have airbags in the vehicles, and you'll see now that fire engines are coming with them, most definitely ambulances, and that includes roll protection. And there's NFPA standards that govern the requirements for fire apparatus. And one of the things you'll see now is you start to see fire apparatus that have the chevrons on the back. And that is from NFPA. When you're determining what type of apparatus and what requirements for that apparatus are, now what typically when you're buying a fire apparatus nowadays, we spec out that it must meet NFPA. The manufacturers pretty much, unless they're a shaky manufacturer, is they're not gonna sell you a fire apparatus that does not meet NFPA. NFPA costs money, it's gonna make it more expensive, but you wanna make sure that you're not buying something that doesn't meet the standard. Once you get your apparatus, you have ongoing operational concerns. And NFPA 1950 is the standard for preventive maintenance, commonly referred to as PM. And then again, it should meet DOT. So preventive maintenance program, your book calls it PMP, but most people refer to it as a PM. You should have a PM schedule for your apparatus. It can either be on a timeline or it can be on a definite at once a month, once a week, whatever you choose. And it's usually going to be driven by how busy that apparatus is. How many miles are you driving? And what you find is that this really extends the life of your apparatus. And I'm talking about small cars, rescue ambulances, fire engines, and ladder trucks. And then you want to make sure that it's a safe vehicle. And everybody on that crew specifically the engineer and the captain, should have the ability to take that apparatus out of service if something is not safe. Now, something that would not safe would be a broken seatbelt. You should not even drive that apparatus or bad brakes. And again, this is easy to say. You'll see some departments out there that have unsafe vehicles, but we should not be doing this. There should be a schedule of service. These apparatus, they weigh a lot. They could be anywhere up from 20,000 pounds to 70,000, 75,000 pounds. You need to choose your drivers carefully. Most places on the West Coast, we call them engineers. Some people on the East Coast call them chauffeurs, but we must choose our drivers carefully. We have to think about the physical response environment that we're going code three. I'm gonna talk about the training in a little bit. And then your book talks here a little bit about response policies. Some departments have response policies that do not allow lights and sirens on certain calls. They may not do reduced lights and sirens or non-lights and sirens. And there was a, I believe it was the Forest Service recently that ordered fire their fire apparatus without lights and sirens. Now, I'm against all three of these. I believe that you have to have good policies on when and when you would not respond with lights and sirens, but you need to give that to that first line supervisor, typically the captain, so that they can make the decisions on when they're gonna use lights and sirens. And a common one may be that, you know, you go on this fire alarm once every, once or twice every shift, and maybe you just don't, if it's just a fire alarm or just a trouble alarm, you would not go lights and sirens. Some departments, they do reduce lights and sirens where the first apparatus goes with lights and sirens, we call it code three and the rest follow without lights and sirens. But personally, I'm against that. I understand why fire chiefs do that. They're trying to reduce their liability. What I'd rather do is give our personnel initial training and give them ongoing training. Let them make the decision. They have to understand that here in California that you have to follow the vehicle code. And what that means is you just can't run a red light just because you have lights and sirens. And most departments have a policy that you're required to stop at red lights. Now, some people say, oh, we have to get there fast. Well, again, you'll look at some of the numbers of injuries and accidents, and quite a few of them occur responding to and from an incident. And we shouldn't have those. When I was a captain and even as a battalion chief, I enforced that we stop at red lights even when going code three. 
because you need to watch out for that traffic, especially nowadays when everybody has nice stereos in their car and they turn them up loud. Everybody has air conditioning and the cars are designing now. The goal is, is to keep the noise outside from coming inside. And we wanna make sure that they can hear us and see us. Again, that care needs to be done with proper training and policies. And one of the ways that we train personnel is when I was the training chief, we developed an engineer's academy. And we didn't choose any of this training or any of these requirements just out of the blue. We went to NFPA, we went to the Department of Transportation here in California, and we chose documents that they use there. And one of these is we would have all of our personnel drive this type of course. What you can see there at the bottom is they, on their start, they drive in frontwards down the straight line. Then they have to back up through that straight line, just where they came from, and then back into what we consider an alley dock or what would be a parking space. Then they pull out of there and they follow that course and they go through a serpentine. They go through it, then they back up all the way back through that same serpentine, typically cones. Then you follow what's called the offset alley where you go through there. Then you come through, you do a parallel park, and then you have to back into what we call diminishing clearance. And that's where you back in where the space is narrower. And what we found is we do this for all our prospective engineers. When we run our recruit tower, we have all of our firefighters or potential firefighters do this course in an ambulance because they're gonna to have to drive our rescue ambulances and we wanna make sure that they know how to drive them. And the second thing is now we have provided that training and we can have proof that we provided everybody with that training. So this is the course. And then when we give promotional exams for engineer, they run through the same exact course. They have to do it again. Again, the stress is a little bit higher there because they're competing for a job, but they must follow this obstacle course. And if you document everything, if you had an accident later on with a lawsuit, you can eliminate some of the liability. Pre-incident planning. Ideally, we should walk through all of our major buildings. So we're talking about pre-incident planning. Uh, this should be on a form that's carried department-wide, only have one form for your department. Pre-incident planning should be done by the responders so they become familiar with the building during the preparation of the plan. There should be a method for updating the plan at a given interview, maybe once a year, maybe more often if you need to. Again, this is easier said than done because you have to have the time to go out to these buildings. And yes, you should, but you may not be able to. If you have a target hazard, and what a target hazard is, is some of your buildings that where you have the most potential to have a major incident. Perfect example is that the Pasadena Fire Department has a great relationship with Caltech, which is in Pasadena. Caltech runs JPL. Caltech, they have both a university there, and they also do a lot of work in basically developing spacecraft and other things. So they do have a lot of chemicals. They do have a lot of potential for fires. So they should be in our, our target hazards. And we've developed that relationship. We have a pre-plan for there. It's based as, as text. It has a site plan, it has a floor plan. We know where they're at at their building and we have them in our apparatus. And you gotta make sure that you update this on a regular basis because you need the proper information. So if you go there in the middle of the night to this target hazard that you know who to call to come out because maybe you have a small fire but you just can't leave there without getting the property owner out. Pre-incident planning is an excellent tool considering pre-incident safety and risk identification so that we, when we do go to these target hazards that we know what's in there and we know where to find things. And one of the things we can find there is how to shut off the sprinkler system if we have a sprinkler head activated. And that can save a lot of water, both water that could cause damage to the property and second water that we have to help clean up. So it's really important. Now, safety and training. Training evolutions have changed over the years. It used to be that we could just go get a house, we'd load this house full of anything we could put in it, pour some gasoline on it, and then light the thing and come in and you know practice on the house. Well, with numerous injuries and numerous deaths occurring because of fire departments doing this, training evolutions have now changed. It must be a controlled evolution, and there's an NFPA standard out there, 1403. And again, this was created as a result of the injuries and deaths. And so this will tell you exactly what you can do. One of the things that comes right off the top of my head is that you can only burn class A fuels in there. 
which is straw and hay, and maybe some lumber. If you're gonna use a house, nowadays you gotta take all the class B's and class C's flammables out of that building and only have class A's because we want to avoid these injuries. And you must have a policy, whether you have a safety manager or a safety chief, that you must adopt a zero tolerance level. When I was in a meeting with Cal OSHA over the trench manual that I'm involved with in writing, a representative from Cal OSHA said, we understand that the fire service is a dangerous profession. We understand that people will get hurt, but what we will not accept and we do not understand is people getting hurt in training. They don't accept that and they said that there should be zero tolerance. So we need to be careful in what we do there and make sure that we don't hurt people. Now accidents do happen, but if you can say we met, and we have a, a checklist that we met all of NFPA 1403 plus many other safety things, then there should be zero liability on individuals or the department. So what does NFPA 1403, what are the procedures and requirements for live fire training? The first thing is student prerequisites. What this says is we just can't just take somebody out the street and put them in a fire building. We have to make sure that, for instance, that they've been trained in self-contained breathing apparatus, that they've been trained in how to use their personal protective equipment, that they've had a fit test for their breathing apparatus. We have to make sure that, they, that they're ready to go into this environment. We have to make sure that the structures and facilities meet the requirement, and I talked about that just a little bit ago. Talked about the fuel materials, too. We have to make sure that we give everybody a safety briefing and we have a safety officer assigned to all these controlled burns. And we need to make sure that there's a plan out there that everybody's read and everybody understands. And the last but not least is instructors. Instructors should be trained as fire training instructors in the state of California and they should know the requirements of NFPA 1403 and typically for live burns that they should be working under somebody that's certified to do live burns in this state as a trainee. They shouldn't be just people coming out there and lighting fires without having that prior training and certification. The IFF, the IFFC, they developed a certification program for employees' health. They want a heart healthy firefighter program. And where it starts with is medical fitness. And what it says there is all employees should have a pre-employment and annual medical exam. So employees before they're ever hired should pass a physical that says they are capable as firefighters. And this physical should be the same one that you give all your personnel yearly or annually. Make sure that your personnel are having an annual medical exam and that they are fit for duty. And there should be someone on the department that follows this up every year. As far as physical fitness, there's five components. Aerobic or cardiovascular fitness, muscular strength, muscular endurance, you should have flexibility, and checking your body compositions to make sure that you do not have too much fat on your body, because as a firefighter, you need to be ready to work on it at a moment's notice. And there's key considerations that you should follow. We don't stop just on the medical aspect of it. We now include emotional and behavioral fitness. And this is a necessary component of the program. And emotional fitness can be improved. People don't realize how much stress and emotional problems can make your health bad. Most departments, if their physical fitness and emotional behavior fitness programs are where they should be today, then they, they include this. And they also include family members. And family members are encouraged to participate. There might be that problem you have at home, and that problem you know, you're never supposed to supposedly carry to work, but we all do. And you gotta make sure that if there's those problems, you try to get rid of those so that you can do your job, so that you're not thinking about those things. And you gotta have these services so that people know where to go get them. And they have to be available to people. And typically, you want them to have a number that they can call and they can contact them without the department being aware of it. Because maybe they have an alcohol or drug problem, or maybe they're having some emotional problems. And some of these may be caused by your employment with the fire department. And you need to be able to, to, to go out and get that help so that, especially if you're an employee that's been there, you know, you're, you're, you're a good employee and we need, to, we need to make sure that you can finish your career. And probably one of the best things that I've seen over time is what's called critical incident stress 
management or critical incident stress debriefing program, commonly referred to as CISD. This is where we, we have programs in the fire service and the one that we had that was for Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena involved several layers. And one layer was you had what was called peer debriefers. And every each of the three departments had a number of personnel that were trained in this. And so if somebody from Pasadena went on a really bad accident or a real bad call, we could call this in and they would notify, the, the personnel would notify the captain, or if it's working right, the captain should ask the personnel after each incident, major incident, do you need CISD? And if the employee says, yes, we would call the other two departments, they would each send typically one person out, and then these two people from other departments would go in and they would talk to this firefighter. What this allows is that if this firefighter, if that bothered this person, he or she, that they could, you know, they could cry in front of these, their peer debriefers, and these people would keep it to themselves. And since they don't work with this person very often, they wouldn't you know, go back and tell tell anybody else about it. So you would know that, hey, I could talk to this person. And then if this didn't work, we would go up to, we'd have a phone number, we'd call and get some healthcare professionals in there and and arrange for follow-up. So it's a really good program. I'm glad it's in the fire service now. So interagency considerations. And this is really important. And it's important that you have all of this done ahead of a major disaster. And I'll give you a couple examples where it's worked for me. But there was Homeland Security Pres Presidential Directive 5. It has to do with mutual and automatic aids. So first let's talk about what are the two differences? The difference between mutual and automatic aid, they're completely different. Mutual aid means that a department has to call another department and ask for help. There is no written automatic response. And just as it says, automatic aid is just the opposite. And a perfect example is you see the picture there of where I'm running a house fire and the closest engine company was actually not even a Pasadena company. It was an LA County engine company and they were first on scene to this house fire. And this was automatic. When someone calls 911, our dispatchers put in the address and it says the first in engine company is engine company 66. They call LA County Fire Department and say send engine 66 to a house fire and they give them the address and they come there and basically they, they worked for me. And this is automatic. It happens automatically. You don't have to call a chief. You don't have to call somebody else to ask for permission. It happens. You need to understand each agency's priorities and roles. I need to know where this equipment's coming from and I need to know that their roles. How many personnel are on the company? This engine company has three people on it, whereas Pasadena, all ours had four. But you need to understand that ahead of time. You need to understand what they have, what they don't have, what they're training. One of the things that's, as I left the fire service a couple years ago, that was in the works is that all radios will now be required to have P25. And rather than go into depth about it, because I don't really understand it, is that it means that all of us can communicate. No matter who we are, I can go to the police and talk to them on my radio and vice versa. And then always, always, you must use incident management systems. And that provides for a unified command, or just for a good command. And an example of this is that where we talk about interagency considerations, my perfect example is when I was a battalion chief, once a month, the battalion chiefs from Glendale, Burbank, Pasadena, LA County, LA City, and the Forest Service, we met for lunch once a month. What that does is it allows you to know who is working for each of these agencies at a different time, and who am I gonna have to work with in case there's a fire or a major incident. And it gives you face recognition. And this worked really well for the station fire, which was the wildland fire that burned across the foothills. And because we had these meetings, I knew all these people when I was sent over as to be the unified commander representing Pasadena, is that I knew the people I was gonna work with. We'd already talked, we'd already agreed on things, and it made our relationship smooth. They knew me, I knew them. It helped to make for a better incident because you gotta remember at that time, that fire was burning 20,000 acres a day. And summary, pre-incident safety encompasses a number of components, including station safety, apparatus safety, response safety, pre-incident planning, safety during training, wellness fitness programs, and interagency relationships. And safety is a state of mind. You have to think safety first. 
and many components can be prepared for it before an incident. You know, you don't want to try to be thinking about safety as you're in the middle of an incident.